Well, this video went on quite a bit longer than I anticipated, so if you don't want to spend all that long in one company, and who can blame you, here's some timing so you can fast forward the video to the particular part you might be interested in. Hooray! The replacement SOSD has arrived. We can now carry on with part two of the review. There's been a bit of a delay, but on the plus side, it's going to let me address some of the questions that appeared in the last video and hopefully incorporate that into this one. So this video is going to cover how to actually connect this up to the NASA, um, how to connect an FTDI adapter so you can change some settings, and how to use the GUI to actually change some settings. And then we'll give the whole thing another flight. Here's our basic NASA setup using the traditional one server wiper channel instead of SBUS or something similar. If you do use SBUS, then this should still all be relevant aside from how the throttle percentage is connected up. I've taken a bit of artistic license with the picture here. The LED and GPS both plug into sockets above the main servo connectors, but as I'm working with a 2D picture, I have them going into the side of the NASA so things are easier to see. Okay, so that's our before wiring if you like, so let's bring in the SOSD. The first connection I make is to remove the LED wire from the PMU and connect it into the SOSD. The SOSD has the labels AETR on the underside of the board to help you orientate the wires the right way around. Next you take one of the provided cables and go from the LED out pins, which are at the bottom row, to the LED input on the NASA. A few guys noted that they weren't seeing the modes on the OSD, but it was working still on NASA. The pins appear to pass through electronically speaking. So it's quite possible to connect everything backwards through the OSD and then still have it work on the NASA. So if you get this, recheck your connections into the OSD. We then repeat this process with the GPS. Disconnect from the NASA, plug into the SOSD and go back out. Top pins this time. Once again, the labels on the underside of the board will help you check you're getting the pins the right way around. You'll also know pretty quickly if this is wrong because the SOSD gets its power through this connection. If you have a receiver that gives RSSI, you can connect this up next. A few things to note here though. First off, by default, RSSI is not activated on the OSD, so if you need it, you will also have to make changes to the OSD via the GUI and FTDI adapter. Secondly, it's analog RSSI, so if you have a PWM-based RSSI output, you'll need to build the little buffer circuit before using it. On the SOSD board, the signal pin is the top one. The next connection you can make, and it is an optional one, is the mode switch. This lets you change the OSD display between the two graphical screens and off. Obviously using the GUI you can configure each one separately, but the off is always off. By default this is set to be on a momentary switch, but that's changeable again in the GUI. Next up is the throttle connection. Again it's optional, and it's one of the things I haven't really bothered with, but may be useful for some. You just need to pull your servo lead out of the T connection in NASA, and plug it into the SOSD. The labelling is not great on the SOSD here. You will find two sets of pins labelled throw. The input is the top one. You then attach a servo lead from the throttle output on the SOSD back into the T-socket on the NASA. Lastly, at least in terms of NASA connections, connect F1 and F2 from the NASA to the SOSD. These connections give you artificial horizon, so if it's something you don't need, it's not something you have to do. Because the diagram has become a bit full of lines, let's do the LiPo VTX and camera connection on a fresh page. There's not much to this one. If you want voltage on the OSD, and really who wouldn't, then you'll need to make a connection to your LiPo. Obviously this isn't the sole connection to the LiPo, you'll still need to power your ESCs and everything else. It's just to make it easier to draw once again. The SOSC should support 3 and 4S LiPos, although at the moment I've only tested 3S. There's also an option to add a current sensor on the pins just below the voltage, but as I don't have one, I haven't been able to test it. Your VTX plugs in here. Again, the picture is just to illustrate, please don't ever power up a VTX without an antenna attached, else it'll blow on you. And finally, the camera. Bear in mind that the video in connection only consists of a ground and a video connection, so if you need to power your camera, you'll need to do that separately. The grounds here are common, so if you power your camera from the same power source, then you should only need the video wire here. This is the FTDI adapter I bought. So a very quick um, guide on how to connect this. USB here, so obviously connect that one. You'll probably have some sort of little 
guide down the pins um, and basically you just need to know which one is the ground pin on this particular one it's this one here all you need to know is that that ground pin will tie up with the the socket here that's slightly square rather than round I'm just trying to get the angle where you can actually see that that's square and these ones are more round that is the where the ground one should go so it slides in like that and when we plug this in a light comes on you'll also want to check you have a good contact here it's quite easy just to move this very slightly and you'll see that LED flicker where the contacts aren't quite bridged there so it's a good idea just to make sure you've got them in a nice position where it can be still I found two sources to get the convict tool the first one which you get a link from for the um, MinNaza OSD project goes to Arducam OSD and there's a download there for the slightly earlier version the other one is if you go to a project called MinOp OSD uh, again there's a download of the slightly later version but I'll put the exact links in the description. Here's the 212 and 213 versions of the GUI. So I expected that the 213 version would have some big changes and enhanced, but in reality it's not really better, it's just different. There are certain different things that appear in 212 and there are other things that appear in 213 and the default panels are laid out slightly differently. Uh, but there's really not much in them, so use whichever one you like. Um, as I've got 213 and it's the latest, I'm going to go ahead and use this one. So let's get rid of that. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is connect our OSD. So hook up the FTDI card as 4 and plug in a USB port. Now I'm using this on my Mac uh, using VMware, so I get an extra box here to say where I'm connecting it to. In case I'm connected to my VM, you should then find a COM port will appear in this drop down box. And once you get to that, you can say read from the OSD. And you should hopefully recognize this as looking like your panel. That's in fact panel 2 and panel 1, looks like that. So there's a few things that will be missing from here if you've used the OSD. Uh, the one is the height uh, and speed ladders. The other is the radar, which don't actually appear anywhere in the GUI. Uh, I believe the ladders just appear, but the radar, uh, I've got no way of finding out where that would go. <laughs> so if you're married to the radar, you might want to do some extra stuff, because I think it looks like some source code will have to be compiled. The basic way of doing this is you can click on anything and you can move it around to your heart's content and you can basically rearrange this how you want to. Uh, if you don't want something like the throttle here, if you click on this, it will delete it. So that's just a case of making things appear and disappear. Um, and you can do it completely independently on each panel. Now it's probably worth read this again, actually keeping hold of this just in case you want to. So I would suggest actually saving this uh, as I had as a default OSD just in case you ever need to go back to it again. Now one thing I noted was that this uh, SOSD defaults to using PAL. So if you want to use NTSC or you've got an NTSC camera or like me you just want 60 frames per second on a GoPro you can change the video mode here. You will notice something though. When I do this, it gets a bit biggy and blockier. This is because although the HD resolutions for PAL and NTSC are the same, in SD, you actually get extra vertical lines in PAL, so you'd get a slightly better picture. Um, but for me, it's, it's a case of, that's the live out view from my camera, so I'm forced into using it. But obviously, it just looks like you get slightly less space and it will crowd you in a bit. So for anybody that noted on the comments that when they connected up it looked like some of their text was disappearing, this is potentially a case of having an NTSC camera and setting it to PAL where, because PAL's got extra lines, some of this information 
down the bottom would be stretched over out, out of the bounds of the screen and you just won't see it. So a common question that comes up is about the RSSI. People saying, I can't get RSSI working, I've, I plugged in my RSSI connection, it's not working. Uh, the main reason it's not working is because RSSI by default isn't turned on. You need to do several things to get RSSI working, uh, the first of which is making sure this is enabled and oops, I up the wrong thing. And then you get this little RSSI symbol and you can put that somewhere. Um, this go hands in hand with actually calibrating the RSSI signal. Um, so that's a two-stage solution. So well, what I want to do now is, is have a look at the what I came up with initially. So this was my first one. And you'll notice different from the original one, what I've done is I've like, oh, let's use all the corner. So I've put things right out in the corner and I've got, yeah, that's an uh, And so I didn't want any space wasted. But when I turned this on, I found out that these things were hiding out the screen. So where this has actually got these gaps around here, they're actually usually quite useful. Now, I don't know if this is dependent on screen, so you might just want to test it, see exactly how far you can push it. So the one I've actually gone ahead with now, I lose more space on the left here and I lose space on the top, but I can push all the way to the bottom. So the sort of things I've got enabled here is I've got my mode, my heading direction, my home distance, my home arrow, uh, all in the same place. Uh, I've got this one, I'm not sure this is useful. This is my, if the GPS is locked or not. Number of satellites, uh, my RSSI, ground speed, because of course I haven't got a, an airspeed. Home altitude, which basically means zero is your takeoff point. Uh, flight timer, voltage, of course, and my lat longitude. On this one, I've also got the artificial horizon. So I didn't change much on panel two. I basically just took the artificial horizon out, but instead I've given myself just here, which I can't actually select, um, the roll and pitch just so I can look at it there. I actually found the artificial horizon okay, but I, I could see it could get in the way occasionally. Uh, the last thing I've got here is the warnings, which I'm just going to come on to in a minute. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this config panel and how we deal with setting everything up here. Okay, so moving on to the config panel, uh, which is pretty important. Uh, there's a couple of things to look at here. So the warnings uh, kind of pop up from this bit. If your stall speed, if you set this to under five kilometers per hour, it, it won't come up and say stall, which is pretty useful in a multi-copter situation because obviously you'd be hovering. So I've given myself an over speed because it seems pretty weird if I was doing more than 90 kilometers an hour. Um, I've given myself a warning on battery voltage of below 10.5, which is my normal sort of landing uh, level. Uh, so the other interesting things here, and I had a couple of comments uh, on YouTube, was about the mode switch. People weren't able to get it set up. Um, now it's, it's actually set default here to um, the mode switch itself. This is supposedly uh, mode switch means if you go for example, from GPS and to attitude and then back again within two seconds, that should move the mode on to the next the next screen, panel one to panel two, for example. Uh, and you see rotation switchings clicked here, which means it will rotate around. In reality, I found this was on a momentary switch, so I'm not exactly sure how to slay out. I'm gonna set it to um, a channel. I mean, I don't know why it's actually coming up with channel numbers because it doesn't know what channel I'm on. I should put it on channel 8 anyway, but in reality it's going to be on channel 11. So this is the other important thing. This is how to set your RSSI. So as it stands, we don't know what our max or min value might be unless we've actually measured it. Now on the card, there's actually a voltage divider uh, oh, sorry, on the on the OSD board. So your receiver is probably putting out between 0 and 3.3 volts for RSSI. 
this voltage divider is going to make sure that no more than 1.1 volts can come in. So I don't think it's get particularly good resolution on that, but we need to see what the raw value is to work out what our, our max value should be. Um, so what you need to do here is click to enable the RSI um, raw value. Um, after we do all that, we need to save our current tabs. I need to do this several times. That is literally just the configuration screen data. We also need to write these panels out in each case as well. That's that. So what we're going to do now, we're going to plug in, find out what our raw value is, and then we can feed that into the max value so we've got a properly calibrated RSSI signal. So to find out the max value we need to feed back into that panel, we turn on and look what it gets to. It says 30% here, but weirdly I found when I fed that 30% value back into the max, I could only get up to 84% on the RSSI. I had to drop it down to 25% to actually register as being 100. So as I said before, the resolution of that RSSI is going to be slightly constrained. Two other interesting things to note here. The alarm works because I haven't got the battery plugged in and hence it's, it's flashing that uh, there's a low battery of zero volts. The other thing is the artificial horizon. In my original SOSD I had to go into the NASA assistant to alter the offset for the gimbal in order to get that artificial horizon line in the middle. In this one um, the, the opposite happened. I had to reset it to zero to get that more uh, mid-level. Uh, so with those changes done, let's go and take the first test flight and see what happened. The reason I turned my DVR on this early is that I wanted to see what would happen to the little lock symbol. And as you see, it goes to 3D once it gets a lock. Although it's seemingly not quite enough lock to give me a GPS reference, which just comes up in a second. And this is where I notice I have the problem. The radar display, which I figured would just go away is still there. I think because it's hard coded in and it's not removable via the GUI. Unfortunately the radar display has covered up my home altitude so during this time I'll have absolutely no idea how high I'm going but I figured I'd give it a test fly anyway just to test the other things out. One of the other things I wanted to test out was the screen switch. I've got this on a freeway switch now and as you can see that seems to work absolutely fine. So after dawdling up to the end of the field, I wanted to try and see if I could get over 90 km an hour to get an overspeed warning. Although there was a little bit of a tailwind here, there wasn't enough to get me past a magical 90 km an hour. I just about managed to get into the 70s. The only other thing of vague interest here is, um, because of the wind, when I put it into a GPS hover, this is the sort of time where I found the AHI reasonably useful. You can see from this indication on the AHI that it's kind of leaning into the wind here to keep stable. But I used up a battery but it was uh, a case of landing it and going back and doing the configuration. The reason this is a pain is because I'd already put all the SOSD back inside the cord and had all the wires in and in order to get it out apart from having to take all the screws out of the top plate to get in there I have to unplug every single thing. You don't want to plug your FTDI adapter in whilst the SOSD is plugged into anything else. Here we are back in the GUI and as I mentioned before there's my RSI max level of 25 which I need to actually represent 100% on the OSD. I've also got my uh, OSD toggles here set to mode switch. It didn't seem to make a difference if it was mode switch or an actual channel number so I just went with whatever. So here's what I need to do. I need to move my home altitude up a line. I also noticed that I figured I had a little bit of extra space near the top of the screen. So what I decided to do is move my top line up a line just to see if I can really maximise out the space I've got there. Okay, well I'll try and keep this brief as this video is already long enough. So I've done the changes and I've popped down to the local park this time just for a bit of a a change of scenery. All I really wanted to do is confirm that my stuff fitted on the screen and the altitude came up in the right place, which it does, which is good, which is essentially it. 
But um, I just popped around for a quick flight anyway, just to uh, take the battery down. So nothing very interesting happened. I noticed that the new cinema building has a solar panel on top. Good luck with that in this weather. It's just a bit of a look around. You can see the woods where I sometimes take the mini quad in. I seem to be getting quite bad video. I found out uh, this is one of my old SKUs made by 3D Gym. One of the lobes has actually come away, so that needs to get uh, replaced. Uh, and I remembered to try using the the different modes. It feels very odd after having all that information on the screen to fly around naked as it was. Uh, but I suppose quite good for framing stuff up if you don't want to see any, any gubbins in the way. And that was that. Down we came and straight back home again. So I'm pretty happy with the setup of it now. The the only minor annoyance is the um, radar that's still in the way. Now I had a look at the code and it seems to be just a simple define where they've defined radar as being active and it links to this piece of code here which then draws it. Uh, it should seem pretty easy just to compile that out but I didn't want to faff around with it anymore. Reason being it's it's tucked in the machine and to get it out and put it back in to test it is a bit of a pain and I want to put it on my new quad but if I go ahead and get another NASA to replace this after I, I rip all the electronics out for a new quad, uh, I might get another SOSD and have a bit more of a mess around with the code, just because I can do it all on the bench without having to uh, install it and take it out again. But that is finally the end, so uh, I hope it's proved useful. If you've got any questions, shove them on the comments. I'll do my uh, best to answer them, and uh, see you next time. Bye!